In this video, we're going to go over what we did that enabled us to be able to stream videos such as YouTube, Netflix, and Hulu while on board our boat. We looked at Starlink and we decided on an LTE 5G wireless solution instead. We're going to talk about why we didn't do Starlink, what we actually did install, and we're going to illustrate the fantastic performance that we we're seeing out of our LTE 5G solution on the boat. If you've got another solution that works for you, please be sure to drop them in the comment section below. Let's get started. The problem we have on the water with our phones is that the cell towers have lots of power and a tall antenna to send the signal to us. But our phones and tablets are limited in power and have a small antenna, so they struggle to actually talk back to the tower. Our boat's an intercoastal cruiser. Our gas tank keeps us within about 60 miles of shore, uh, but our boating lifestyle actually keeps us much closer, usually within about 15 miles of shore. Power management was also very important to us as we wanted to be able to run this while we were underway um, or while we were anchored or, at, or next to a dock. So we really wanted it to be powered by 12 volt DC and not have to run the inverter. We also have a TV on board and thought it'd be great if we could run a Roku or an Amazon Fire Stick as both are powered via a USB port. So why not Starlink? Well, when we evaluated Starlink, the first thing we noticed was the large size of the antenna. It's a phased array antenna and comes with motors that it actually uses to track the satellites. It's debatable whether those um, motors are actually needed on a boat, but regardless, the mounting the antenna would be a challenge on our 27 foot boat. Looking at the power requirements, Starlink also is powered via 120 volt AC and consumes about 35 to 60 watts while running. Um, Starlink also does not currently support usage while moving, although I suspect that'll change sometime in the future. Um, it's it, portability just means you can move it from location to location, um, but it's it's technically not supposed to be used mobile while you're underway. So all of that led us to an LTE 5G Wi-Fi solution instead. The biggest game changer for us was the installation of a PepWave Mobility 42G high gain 7-in-1 antenna. The antenna has four LTE antennas, two Wi-Fi antennas, and one GPS antenna. I mounted it high up on the mast above the radar dome. I wanted it to have a clear 360 degree view around and to be able to be in, and I wanted it outside of the beam of the radar. I also did not want to extend the antenna cables as I'd lose a lot of power to the attenuation. Whenever you install a system like this, it's always more important to put the router um, as close to the antenna as possible and extend 12 volt DC to the router um, as much as you have to, um, to keep those antenna cables short. So what's a high gain antenna? Um, the antenna takes the power um, that it has and rather than radiate it out in all directions, it focuses that antenna towards shore where those cell towers are. Um, also, the lower frequencies are capable of traveling much further distances than the higher frequencies. This was a key point in why I picked T-Mobile as one of my two carriers. They operate with what's called band 71, which is the 617 megahertz frequency, which is the lowest of all the carriers currently. We installed a PepWave Max BR1 Pro 5G Wi-Fi slash LTE router. I mounted the router upside down center line in the cabin directly at the bottom of the mast. The antenna came with a, a two meter cable and I had about all of six inches of antenna cable to spare. Measure twice, cut once, so we say, right? Uh, I run two SIM cards, AT&T and T-Mobile for diversity. Both have great coverage in the Pacific Northwest and the San Juan Islands. For Canada and Southeast Alaska, AT&T is going to be my preferred carrier. I get 50 gigs a month with T-Mobile and 100 gigs per month with AT&T. T-Mobile, it's a hard stop at 50 gig on their data plan. Um, AT&T at, at 100 gigs, um, if I go over that, then they can throttle me if they so desire. Um, T-Mobile is usually faster than AT&T, what I've found when traveling throughout the San Juan uh, Islands. And Puget Sound, it just depends where I'm at, whether it's AT&T or T-Mobile. I spent a, a lot of time actually looking at cell phone coverage maps and stuff when I was putting this all together. So last weekend, um, we were actually headed to Port Ludlow from Everett. As I'm coming around um, Possession Bar, I benchmarked 173 megabit while I was cruising at 25 knots. Then when we crossed Admiralty Inlet and came around Foulweather Bluff, we actually lost T-Mobile coverage. The router noticed the connectivity was so poor and it automatically switched over to AT&T and we were back up and running. 
Uh, streaming video using the Roku that's powered off the USB port on the back of the TV. We're seeing about three megabit of usage, which equates out to about 1.3 gigs an hour. So that's about 70 hours of streaming just using our AT&T data plan per month. We also use the Wi-Fi portion of the router to piggyback off of Guest Marina Wi-Fi and save usage on our data plans. This works usually until about 4 p.m. when Marina Guest Wi-Fi gets overcrowded. And then we just switch back to LTE 5G and use our plans. I'm also able to check in on the boat's electrical system from anywhere via Victron's web portal or their, their VRM app on my phone. Kind of a nice to have. Uh, Cost-wise, the antenna cost $250 and the router was another $1,200. Uh, installation, I did all myself and it took me a full day. If you're interested in seeing what it took to install this setup, please check out this video and thanks for watching.